Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to Outdoor Worship at New Dublin Presbyterian Church. I may be seated or barefoot more often than I usually am. Uh, and this is because I'm dizzy this morning and I'm trying not to fall off these stairs. Uh, so excuse me for sitting and being barefoot more often than usual or just clinging to this pulpit more often than usual. That's why that is. Session met last week and, among other things, voted to resume indoor Sunday school for adults. And we will begin that on May the 23rd following state guidelines and the guidelines from the CDC. So uh, I will be gone next week. That's the next announcement. I'm not going to be here next Sunday. I will be leaving this tomorrow early, far too early, about four in the morning tomorrow to go uh, do a continuing education course, and Graham Mitchell will preach this coming Sunday. I want to remind you of the re-entry survey that was emailed to you sometime last week. If you need me to send that to you again, I will, if you just let me know. Finally, Happy Mother's Day! There are carnations over here. If you are a mother or act as a mother to someone, or if you're going to see your mother later today and want to bring her one, or if you just want to take one, they're over here, um, and please feel free at the end of worship. Is there anything else that needs to come to the attention of our community this morning? Get the witness garden. Thank you. Um, can, do you want to come and make that announcement with this microphone? Uh, this Tuesday at the church, we will meet anyone interested in coming to help work on our witness garden. Uh, as you leave today, go out by the cemetery. You can see where it's been plowed and tilled, and we're going to be ready to plant it uh, within the next 10 days. To what time on Tuesday? Six o'clock. Six o'clock on Tuesday at the church. If you're interested in the witness garden. Anything else? Then let us call ourselves to worship. No, we don't call ourselves to worship. The Lord calls us to worship and we answer. I'm trying not to say that anymore. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house ever singing your praise. Let us pray. Lord our God, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Cleanse us this morning from all the things that distract us, that promise us rest, and cannot fulfill their promises so that we may attend to you and to your word and there truly find rest for our souls. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is Rejoice the Lord is King and it is in your bulletin insert.
friends, the scripture says that if we say But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Friends, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And be at peace. Lord our God, we thank you for giving us these scriptures as a gift for our learning and our benefit. And we ask that you would sharpen the ears of our faith so that what we hear with our ears would sink into our hearts and there bear fruit. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We are continuing on with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount today. So our scripture is coming from Matthew 6, verses 1 to 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases, as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Struggling. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Thank you. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. A few years ago, when I was in Scotland for the first time, the trip I met him on, I was out doing the typical tourist thing. Nathan was very patient about it. He went with me most of the time, visited the castles and the churches and the ruins and take pictures and post them on Facebook and Instagram. I visited a lot of them, but one I remember clearly was this very, very old church, old, old, old like European old, that still had an active congregation. It was a decent bus ride outside of Edinburgh, and it was loaded with these beautiful stone carvings. It was gorgeous. But the very first thing I noticed when I walked in was the very modern sign in the entry hall that said, please don't take pictures. And I say this to you as a confession. My first thought on reading that sign was, well, what's the point of coming then? I quickly came to my senses, of course, and shook myself off. Obviously, it's a great privilege to see things with your eyes, even if you can't post them to social media, you know? But that's the draw of the social medias, isn't it? They start out as a way of keeping up with our friends. The focus is outwards. What are the people we love and care about doing? But then if we're not careful, cool posts to try to prove that we're interesting, cool people. The focus, then, of course, is shifting inwards to self-anxious performance. And when we go all the way down that road, we begin to sacrifice the reality of our lives to the unreality of the internet so that it's no longer worth experiencing a beautiful church or a sunset or a road trip if we can't document it to show the world that we are cool, interesting people. Our self-worth ends up tied to how many likes and comments and clicks we can get. We want to be happy. And we think that the attention and admiration of other people, whether we know them or not, especially if we don't know them, will give us that. The older people can laugh at the younger people if they want to here. It's laughable. But even if TikTok and Instagram belong to the older generations, Facebook is increasingly middle-aged and older. So no one, despite generation, is immune to the appeal. And that's because the problem isn't with the social medias. Social media draws it out, but it was there before social media, and if there is ever a time after social media, it will be then too. It existed in Jesus' time. The problem is that we humans have a fantastic ability to take any problem, any situation, any activity, and make it about ourselves. That's what Jesus noticed anyway. In the part of his sermon that we heard today, he takes three central activities that people who follow God do and shows us the traps we tend to fall into when we do them. And then because he's the great physician and not the great berater, he gives us some medicine, an antidote to fix it. He starts out with the practice of charitable giving, almsgiving, we used to say. And in Jesus' time, this was a combination of what we might call social security 
and then also the more usual sense of private giving. So if you lived in a town long enough, about three months, you became responsible for giving to the soup kitchen. And if you lived there a little longer, you became responsible for giving to the charity box as well. And on top of those kind of socially organized responsibilities, it was a good thing, religiously speaking, to give extra if you could manage it. Because it's true then as it is true today that the need of the community often outpaced the capability of the socially managed safety net. So charitable giving then as now was considered one of the central activities, the central religious activities of people who loved God. And charity by its nature is intended to be focused outward. It's intended to be focused toward the people who need something. It's in the name, right? Charity is love. And love for God is manifesting as love for neighbor. But listen, we can make anything about ourselves. And that includes our charity. So Jesus draws us a kind of satirical picture of this tendency. Here comes someone down the street who wants to make a big gift at the synagogue. And they want everybody to notice what a good person they are. So they have someone blow a trumpet in front of them so that everybody within about a half mile radius will turn around and see what good people they are. Watch them give their big gift. And at that point, of course, it's not about the needy anymore. It's about the person giving the gift. It's about what a good, generous person they are. Now you can replace the trumpet with whatever you like. Instagram pictures or newspaper articles or email blasts or marketing campaigns. The method for drawing attention changes with every generation. But the impulse remains the same. In our self-obsessed little worlds, we take a practice that's intended to exercise and make stronger our love for God and our neighbors and use it to exercise self-love instead. So Jesus gives us some practical instructions to knit that impulse in the bud. When you give, don't let your right hand know what your left is doing. Try not to even notice you're giving yourself, let alone make other people notice it. Do it just for the glory of your Father who sees in secret, and you will get your reward from him. It's not that the secrecy itself is a virtue. We can take that and make it a legalistic rule that we get anxious about. But the secrecy will give space for the real point of charity to flourish. It will keep our tendency for self-aggrandizement from smothering the real point of charity. That's why Jesus says to keep it secret. Similarly with prayer. We have all suffered through long, rhetorically impressive prayers, haven't we? Or worse, prayers that are secretly little lectures for the people listening, that aren't directed at God at all. And our family growing up, we used to call these preacher's prayers, and I take it as a caution. Jesus calls it the prayer of a Gentile person who doesn't really know God. More words, fancier sentences, impressive references might impress the people who are listening. But we're mistaken if we think that they will attract the attention and admiration, and admiration of God. Now, of course, sometimes we do need to pray publicly. We've done it today. We're going to do it more today. Sometimes we pray publicly and at length, which we will do here in the prayers of the people. But ideally, and feel free to mention it to me if we don't make it, the length is, is um, decided, determined by the amount of things that need praying for, right? Not just to sound pious and impressive. Jesus 
prayed publicly himself sometimes, and sometimes those prayers were long, but they were never ostentatious. And much more often, much more frequently, we read that he went away to a private place in the middle of the night or before sunrise and prayed there in private. Again, the secrecy itself is not the point. It's the medication, not the health. When we pray publicly and impressively so that other people notice, once again, we've subverted the point of prayer. Just like with charitable giving, we've turned our attention away from God and towards the people around us who might think that we're so pious and good. We've turned it into attention-seeking. And so Jesus gives us two bits of instructions, two antidotes to the poison of self-seeking prayer. First, say your prayers in private where nobody will notice how, how pious you are. And two, say simple prayers that are like the Lord's Prayer. There's a lot to be said about this prayer that Jesus gives us, and we will say more about it week after next. This week is a 10,000 foot view. We'll zoom in a little bit next time I preach. But for now, I want to just draw your attention to the first two words of the prayer. Our Father. If you're a parent, or if there's a child or two in your life that you love, think about it. If, when the child wants to talk to you, would you need them to address you in pretty rhetorical, show-offy little sentences that are intended for the benefit of their friends, or would you just rather they ask for what they need in plain language? Jesus is encouraging us to say our prayers simply in trust for the Father's love for us and wherever possible to say them privately because limiting the potential for the attention of other people encourages our focus outwards on God, on the people we're praying for. And then finally, Jesus turns his attention to fasting, which is not something we do often here and now, but Jesus assumes it's something his followers do. We'll talk about that more another time. But even if you don't fast in the traditional sense, there's probably something you avoid out of desire to follow Jesus better. Maybe certain kinds of media, certain TV shows. Maybe you abstain from certain activities that other people in your social circle do, or you've given up certain opportunities so that you can attend worship or small group. Whatever it is, the old temptation rears its head again. Fasting is supposed to help you focus on God. But if we make it obvious we're fasting, other people will notice. And wouldn't it be nice? to get a little recognition for what a good person you're being. In Jesus' day, this looked like breaking certain social norms, not washing your face, not oiling your hair, going around looking mopey. In other words, inflicting your fasting on other people so that they'll be sure to notice. In our time, maybe it looks like humble bragging or showy complaining or loudly, ostentatiously refusing to participate in whatever it is you're not doing. Instead, Jesus says, try not to let anyone know. Try to keep it secret. Wash your face. Look normal. Be happy. My friend includes drink caffeine in this category because she knows if she doesn't, she's inflicting her fasting on other people. Do what you have to do. Keep it between yourself and God, and God will see it and reward it. Three issues, but the same problem. Ostentatious charity, long, impressive public prayer, showy fasting. All these things take something good, something focused on God and on our neighbors, and turns it into a public display of our own virtue. In each of these things, our attention is supposed to be on someone else, but we fall into the trap of stealing that attention for ourselves because we want other people to see how good we are 
because we want that public approval, that public admiration, because we think it's going to make us happy. And over and over again, the Bible counters this tendency of ours to seek happiness in the approval of other people by telling us about love. We are to love the Lord our God with everything in us. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love. Because love, by nature, isn't about us. If it is, it isn't real love. Love is about the thing or person that we love. It's the antidote to this sinful self-focus that turns anything at all into a performance of our own interesting coolness, our own virtue, our own goodness. Think about God's love for us. Because it was real love and not a self-glorifying performance, God is willing to do the opposite of self-glorifying. Philippians reminds us that though Jesus was in his very nature God, he doesn't cling to it, but empties himself. That's love. Self-emptying focus on the other person. Maybe it feels like a sacrifice. Maybe it feels like a kind of death. But that's what's going to make us happy in the end. It's hard for us to believe it because our culture is self-obsessed. We're looking for happiness. We think we'll find it in the admiration of other people. I heard yesterday an ad for a hair removal product, of all things, ow, of all things, that advised the viewers to worship themselves and the world will follow. And of course it was a Twitch ad, so I heard it five times in one hour. But the brute force of repetition won't make it true. We've seen the result of that advice as it plays out on our screens. And the result is skyrocketing levels of anxiety and depression. Jesus says that when we do our good deeds for other people, we've received the reward we were seeking. And so we have, and it hasn't made us happy. Quite the opposite. Self-worship, as it turns out, doesn't work. It doesn't fulfill its promise. We will only find the happiness and peace we're seeking when we learn to follow Jesus' lead, to attend to other people in love. When we do our good deeds in secret, our attention is forced to land where it ought to be, outside us. And even if we might initially object, what's the point, like I did with the sign in the church, there's a reward to this path, too, because the God who sees in secret sees what we do in secret. And what is done in secret is done only for his approval. And unlike the attention and approval of other people, God's attention and approval is eternal. And there we will find true joy. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Please join me in, I'm sorry, in an affirmation of faith, which is found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
We have arrived in the time in our worship service where we pray for other people. I know that uh, Rementa Burris has asked for our prayers for her son, Wesley, who is back in the hospital with problems with his other leg. So we will pray for Wesley. Who else in our community or outside of it needs our prayer this morning? We will continue to remember the family of Blair Sanders in our prayers. Seeing no others, let us pray. Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that in your love for us, you want to hear our prayers, that you care about what we care about. And confiding in your parental love this morning, this Mother's Day, we give you thanks for all of our mothers, biological or not, who have nurtured us, who have been images of you to us. We ask that you would bless them with joy and patience and a sense of the importance of their work, especially those with small children, whether that work is acknowledged by the world or not. We pray for the world that you created and that you love, asking your presence and your healing at all points where it suffers. This morning, we pray especially for India as it struggles with the virus, for Mexico as they mourn the results of the bridge collapse, for the flooding in Yemen and in all places that suffer from natural disaster. We pray for the church that you have called out of the world in love, especially praying for congregations that live in persecution. We ask that the blood of the martyrs would be the seed of the church, that you would give them joy and courage and favor in the eyes of their governments. We pray for congregations in places where the temptation is to complacency. That you would fill us with your joy. That you would send us about your work. We would not fall asleep. We pray for our nation. For Joe, our president, and Ralph, our governor and all who make and enforce our laws, asking that they would lead us with wisdom and faithfulness and not out of selfish motives or partisanship. We praise you that in many places the weight of the virus is lifting and ask that you continue to heal us we pray especially for our community, for Wesley as he faces more surgery, and for the family of Blair Sanders as they grieve, and for others that we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. Work in their lives wonders beyond all we could ask or think. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is Lead On, O King Eternal. keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>